Uh, my name is Jeanette Wixlim. I'm a, a research professor here at Perry. And I'm going to be the moderator for this last set of presentations before we do our um, wrap up lunch conversation. This is the sixth se session. And the title of the session is Advances and Challenges in Organizing Campaigns. Let me put my on. Um, unfortunately, one of our presenters, Keith Bullard, uh, can't make it, so we'll have our three presenters. And I'm going to give just some brief introductory um, introductions of each speaker, um, as well as the order and a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so let me just start with the introductions. Um, our first presenter is going to be Claudia Rosales. She is the executive director of the Pioneer Valley Workers Center here in Northampton, Massachusetts. Prior to becoming the executive director, she worked as a farm worker organizer. Claudia is also a founding member of the Riquezas del Campo, I'm sorry for my pronunciation, an immigrant-led, worker-owned cooperative farm in Hatfield, uh, Massachusetts. Claudia grew up in a farming family in El Salvador where she worked for many years. She's intimately familiar with the difficult realities immigrants face in the United States and believes in organizing to build a better future. So she will be our first presenter. Anna Canning is our second presenter. Anna Canning is the Director of Communications for the Worker Driven Social Responsibility Network. Prior to joining the WSRN, she was campaign manager for Fair World Project, a watchdog of ethical certifications. There, she led creative campaigns against corporate fair washing of human rights abuses based on in-depth analysis of fair trade and other certification standards. Anna has over 15 years of experience working in supply chains and in movements for food justice and human rights. Our third presenter is going to be Kate Palberg Kavam, and apologies for the pronunciation. <laughs> uh, she is the executive director of the Milk with Dignity Standards Council in Burlington, Vermont, a nonprofit dedicated to upholding the human rights of dairy workers by monitoring and enforcing labor and housing standards on farms in the Milk with Dignity program. Prior to working with the MDSC, Kate directed a nonprofit supporting asylum seekers in southern Vermont and spent the previous decade as a college professor teaching and writing about Latin American social movements. Kate holds a doctorate in Latin American studies. So those are our three presenters. Um, uh, we have been following a format of 20 minutes per presenter, but Claudia is going to have a translator, so we're going to extend your period of presentation time to, to accommodate for that. And um, also, Claudia is going to be using a um, uh, flip chart, <laughs> a flip chart. So it may be wise for some people to move from the back of the room to the front of the room in case it's hard to see what's on the flip chart. So if you want to rearrange yourselves, please feel free. Otherwise, I will hand it over to Claudia. And I'm sorry, and Liana is the translator for Claudia. Thank you. Oh, ya. <risa> bueno, gracias a cada uno de ustedes por estar acá. Me complace el día de hoy venir a hablar de la organización y de lo que hacemos nosotros. Primeramente, yo les quiero presentar lo que es nuestra misión. Thank you everyone for being here. I'm happy to share with you um, information about my organization. We'll start with the mission. Y nuestra misión es construir el poder con trabajadores inmigrantes y de bajos salarios en todo el oeste del estado de Massachusetts. Our mission is to build power of immigrant workers who are low-wage workers in Western Massachusetts. Eh, para contarles un poco de mi información, cómo llegué hasta esta organización, pues fui trabajadora por seis años en el campo. To tell you about my background, I was a farm worker for six years. Eh, eh, experimenté muchos abusos en algunas fincas y dado a todo esto alguien me habló de esta organización y aquí fue donde me empoderaron a conocer mis derechos laborales. I experienced a lot of abuses on a farm and someone told me about this organization and I was able to join the organization and learn about addressing worker exploitation. Y eso es lo que a mí me motiva día a día, trabajar por mi comunidad, por todos estos trabajadores que verdaderamente día a día, ellos son trabajo, trabajadores esenciales y viven diferentes abusos y muchas veces no nos damos cuenta públicamente de todo lo que está pasando. And this is what motivates me day by day, supporting these essential workers, because they really are essential and they are facing a whole array of different abuses. Actualmente tenemos la campaña de justicia para trabajadores del campo. Right now we have the Farm Workers Justice Campaign. 
Estamos luchando fuertemente para que ellos puedan ganar el overtime después de las 55 horas trabajadas en el campo. We're fighting so that workers can get paid overtime who are working 55 hours a week. Las familias merecen también tener un día de descanso pagado por el patrón, ya que ellos necesitan hacer las cosas con sus hijos, llevarlas a las citas médicas o ir a la lavandería. Hay muchas cosas que hacer es que a veces ellos no tienen tiempo porque trabajan los siete días de la semana. Um, because workers also need, and the other thing we're demanding is a day of rest that is paid by the boss, because workers need to do very basic things like bring their kids to appointments, um, go to their own medical appointments, go and wash their laundry, and these are things that aren't possible when they don't have a day of rest. Y algo muy importante que es eliminar el sueldo submínimo del estado del libro de Massachusetts, ya que es a 8 dólares para trabajadores del campo. No decimos que lo están haciendo los finqueros que están pagando a 8 dólares, pero sí conocemos fincas donde les han pagado a 10 dólares y creo que eso es una injusticia. Debería de ser el saldo mínimo a 15 como los demás. And another thing we're demanding is the elimination of the subminimum wage in, for farm workers in Massachusetts, because that's $8 an hour. And there are some farms that are paying, for example, $10 an hour, but that falls far short of the Massachusetts minimum wage, which is $15 an hour. Estamos con la coalición de la abogada Claudia Quintero. Eh, la verdad, estamos eh, recopilando los testimonios de los trabajadores del campo. Ellos ya han venido a hablar con los legisladores, es, eh, han participado en prensa. Estamos haciendo todo lo posible para que ellos puedan ganar estos derechos. And we're working in coordination with the law firm of Claudia Contero, whom you heard from yesterday. Um, we're collecting farm worker surveys, we're engaging with legislators, and we're working with the media. Lo digo porque muchas veces nosotros sabemos que la comida llega hasta nuestras mesas, disfrutamos de las verduras frescas, disfrutamos de las cosas que tenemos, pero no pensamos en lo que los trabajadores están viviendo en el lugar de trabajo. While we enjoy all the fresh food that comes to our tables, we often don't think about the conditions that the farm workers are facing who grow this food. Así que es importante que nos unamos todo como comunidad para poder apoyarlos y que esto sea posible. So it's important that we all unite and join together as a community to make these changes possible. También estamos trabajando en una campaña que se llama Ice Fuera de Massachusetts. Esto es con Javier de la organización de ACLU. Um, we're also working on a campaign that's called ICE out of Massachusetts, which is Immigration and Customs Enforcement out of Massachusetts, and we're working with Javier from the ACLU. Ese es otro problema que vemos para nuestras familias inmigrantes, a separación de familia, dado a que muchas veces eh, ICE colabora con la policía y pasan información y vienen las detenciones y comienzan los problemas. Y creo que nosotros como familias también tenemos derecho a estar unidos y a no estar pensando en ese tipo de problemas en este lugar. And this is another issue that's really important for immigrant workers, which is the issue of family separation, because we know that ICE frequently collaborates with the police, but families do have a right to be together and not have parents and children separated from each other. Eso es eh, en todo el estado de Massachusetts, pero en el 2018 yo recuerdo que sí logramos hacerlo en el estado de Springfield, de poner esa ley que ICE no colaborara con la policía y por eso nosotros creemos que también lo podemos hacer a todo el nivel del estado. So that is a fight that we're working on currently at the state level in Massachusetts, and it's a fight that we were successful in winning in the city of Springfield in 2018, where we got ICE to stop collaborating with the police. Y otra de las campañas que fue todo un éxito, una victoria para toda la comunidad inmigrante fue la licencia en el estado de Massachusetts. Another successful fight that we had was the victory for all of at the state level in Massachusetts for all immigrants, which is the right to driver's licenses. Doy las gracias a todas las personas que hicieron esto posible, que apoyaron de una o de otra manera, igual las organizaciones. Eh, nosotros actualmente estamos apoyando a la comunidad con las traducciones, eh, con la cita. Alguien que necesita llevar un traductor. Eh, tenemos compañeros que están directamente trabajando con la comunidad. And I really give everyone thanks who helped us in this campaign. Um, we've been now working with the community and helping people get their appointments, helping people um, with, with um, linking up with interpreters so that they can have the appointments they need. 
Y actualmente pues también tenemos una distribución eh, de alimentos para nuestra comunidad y esto lo hacemos una vez al mes para todas las comunidades donde más de 100 familias se ven beneficiadas mensualmente y a través de esto nosotros organizamos porque hablamos con los trabajadores, vemos los problemas que están pasando, qué campañas quieren enfocarse ellos. And another one of our programs is our food distribution program. This is a program where we distribute food monthly to 100 families who benefit every single month. And during the food distribution, we talk to them about what the conditions are like in their workplaces, what sorts of challenges they're facing, what sorts of violations they're experiencing, and they, what they want to do to address those issues. Tenemos eh, dos comités de membresía. Eh, tenemos un comité en Springfield, Massachusetts, y tenemos uno en Northampton. Eh, los reunimos también una vez por mes. We have two membership committees, worker committees. One is in Springfield and one is in Northampton. We meet monthly. Y pues en nuestro comité de Springfield la mayoría son trabajadores del campo y hay muchas personas que nos están pidiendo hacer una campaña de tener un baño digno en el lugar de trabajo, ya que en esta temporada hicimos encuestas a más de 150 trabajadores del campo y la mayoría no tienen un baño digno que usar, sino que ellos cuentan las historias que toca ir al... No, bueno, no cuentan, cuento yo también porque trabajé en el campo y me tocaba ir al monte. ¿Qué podíamos hacer? So in our Springfield Worker Committee, most of the committee members are farm workers, and one of the big issues for them is lack of access to bathrooms. Um, we did a survey of more than 100 farm workers, and one of the <coughs> biggest things that they raised is that there are no restroom facilities at these farms, and they tell us stories, and well, they don't have to tell the stories, because I can tell the stories too when I was a farm worker, that I just have to like go somewhere into the hill or the woods to go to the bathroom. Entonces es una campaña que queremos hacer en el futuro, en el 2024. Y como digo, yo sé que tenemos actualmente otras cosas, pero creo que los trabajadores son necesidades que necesitan ser cambiadas. So that's one of our um, key campaign goals for the next year, for 2024. And I know there are many other priorities, but this is one of the key things that we're going to focus on. Nada más ayer tuvimos una conferencia con trabajadores del campo, eh, tuvimos entrevistas con ellos y ellos comentaban cómo trabajaron en el calor bajo esa temporada, otros los despidieron del trabajo, otros perdieron el trabajo dado a las inundaciones y todo lo que pasó en este tiempo. Y ellos comentaban que el jefe supuestamente de la finca recibió dinero que venía del Estado y ellos no recibieron nada, estaban consternados y... Incluso pidieron que nosotros levantáramos la voz por ellos y tal vez publicar para que llegara todo esto a, a, a los empleadores más que todo. So yesterday we held a conference with farm workers and they talked about many issues that they faced this year in the farms in Massachusetts. Um, one issue was the high temperatures. Another was the... Um, Was, was that they received no, was the floods on the farms. And after the flooding that destroyed some crops, farm, farm owners, farmers received money from the state government, but that same money wasn't passed on to the workers on those farms who were fired and lost their wages. So that's one thing that we're looking at doing is raising our voices to support them and working with the media. Podemos ver que la comunidad inmigrante a veces tiene miedo a alzar su voz porque unos no conocen los derechos, otros tienen miedo a ser despedidos o que el jefe levante represalias en contra de ellos. Es por eso que yo digo que es importante como organización unirnos y yo siempre, nosotros visitamos los campos durante el verano, les hablamos, les decimos que inviten a más amistades para que ellos puedan saber sobre todo lo que está pasando, porque de igual manera a mí me abusaban en el trabajo, me gritaban, me trataban mal y por miedo a ser despedida, no alzaba mi voz. So one of the things that we do when we're talking to farm workers is really addressing their fear of using their voices, which is um, very common in the immigrant community because the immigrants worry that if they speak up, if they raise their voices, if they speak against the exploitation, that they're going to be fired or they're going to be retaliated against by their bosses. And so what we do is we visit farms and we talk to workers and we ask them to connect us with their friends and we build relationships of trust. And this is really important because that's what happened to me 
too, is that I, w I was afraid to speak out about the exploitation I was facing as a farm worker because I thought I would be fired. Y pues aquí estamos como centro obrero, creemos en organizarnos para construir el poder de todos estos trabajadores colectivamente. Mi sueño futuro siempre es tener sindicatos independientes, asociación de trabajadores, donde ellos solo puedan pelear por sus derechos y no tener miedo. Sé que todo esto se puede hacer porque dice que unidos jamás serán vencidos. So that's what we do as the Worker Center, and our really our ultimate vision is to support workers in forming independent unions, and that they can use those unions to fight for better conditions. Um, and I believe that united, we can never be defeated. Y pues esta es mi presentación. Gracias a cada uno de ustedes. Si tienen preguntas, pues aquí estoy. That's my presentation. Thank you to each and every one of you. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Great, thank you, Claudia. Um, let's move on to our next presenter, Anna, and we'll do questions at the end, as we have in the other sessions. Worker-Driven Social Responsibility Network. Uh, we're a network made up of worker organizations and partners who are developing worker-driven social responsibility programs around the globe and supporting, spreading this model of binding agreements for market-driven enforcement of workers' human rights. And I have the good fortune of speaking in the last session on the last day, so you have heard from various ones of our members and wonderful allied researchers who have spoken about this model over the last two days. So I am well aware I am at risk of being redundant here, but <laughs> we'll try to keep your interest. Um, here's my plan. So I'm going to lay out in some broad strokes <coughs> what the model is. Uh, and you know, you've heard from various members what that model, especially the Care Food Program, what that looks like. We'll be looking at the model overall. And then the world that it exists in this world of globalized supply chains. And then we'll talk some about the work that we do as a network, bringing our global members together, all focused, as per the theme of this panel, on campaigning. Uh, oh yeah, and that's a photo of members of Migrant Justice, who is just up, down, I never remember, New England geography in Vermont. <laughs> look at where WSR programs exist currently or where worker organizations are exploring the model and how they might adapt it to their own industries, just to give you a picture of the scope of the model currently. Uh, I'm not going to do a deep dive into each of these programs, but they're all worker driven and they're all based on the same fundamental principles adapted for their specific industries. So, what is worker-driven social responsibility? Sorry, I am a minimalist PowerPoint person, so we're just going with that and I'll talk through it. Um, as multiple people have pointed out, worker-driven social responsibility is really named in contrast to corporate social responsibility. And I think the DNA of how that came about is really helpful. So, I think Liana talked some yesterday about how in the 90s there started to be revelations of Nike sweatshops. And you know that story really started even earlier. Like back in the 60s, just 4% of US footwear was imported. That's now 98%. Yeah. And you know, Nike was the one who really led the industry in that offshoring. So that looked like cost-cutting measures, subcontracting manufacturing out to places with lower and lower wages lower rates of unionization, and then continually squeezing those factory owners, those intermediate suppliers, to do more with less. 
And so, you know, then a few decades into that trend of lower wages, lower costs, et cetera, then you see the consequences of Nike's purchasing practices really come to light uh, with exposés of those horrific conditions. Following that, huge pressure from student activists, labor and human rights activists to do better. And then in Nike, you see, I think, the real germ or the origin of that response that we see up through now, which is, nope, we got this, right? Like, we can regulate ourselves. We are responsible. And that's really the rise of corporate social responsibility, is that push to get activists off our back. And I think that there's two really important lessons there, right? One, the marketing push and one that strong push for corporate self-regulation. And that DNA, I think, still really shapes what we see with corporate social responsibility being led by corporations, prioritizing pr protecting their reputations. Am I going really fast for interpretation? You're doing great. OK. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry. I hate to leave people behind. Um, and you know that corporate self-regulation that we see has evolved in different forms. That there is, of course, you know, the corporations just saying, like, we got this, we can regulate ourselves. But as Liana alluded to yesterday, there's also been a huge growth in multi-stakeholder initiatives to do that work. Uh -oh. Now we're stuck with me, a hand talker, and a handheld mic. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. All right. Um, so there's a lot of different sorts of multi-stakeholder initiatives and a whole body of them that take on product labeling and making various eco-social claims. And that's what I'm referring to when I talk about multi-stakeholder initiatives right now. Um, and I'm getting into this detail because when we talk about global supply chains, that is one of the ways that there has been effort to protect human rights in those supply chains. And when we are doing campaigns, we run up against that a lot. So that's part of laying the groundwork for these campaigns. So you know, one of the most common features that we see are certifications, that label that goes on products when you're in the store. And what's behind those? I'm just going to take a quick moment to say. Um, yeah, we're still on that slide. Um, so you have multi-stakeholder initiatives which set standards. So the concept there is that you have different stakeholders who then all weigh in on what the standards should be. So you get companies at the table, you get suppliers, brands at the end of the ends of supply chains, NGOs, all weighing in on what those standards should be. And that sounds great in theory, right? Like everybody has a perspective, brings that to the table. But what that means is that you really get all these different voices weighing in, on this case, on what the standards of work and living should be for workers. And those workers often don't have a voice at that standard setting table. Or if they do, it's a very token one. Um, I think that there was a study of these standard setting bodies, and just 13% of all of them have any sort of component that represents workers in the standard setting and governance process. Um, so, you know, if they, they are often outnumbered by other parties at that table, and the structure overall also really obscures who in that process are actually the rights holders as opposed to beneficiaries of a program. Um, and so, you know, I think it's really useful to note that if our legislative system does not already have enough corporate influence on it, what these multi-stakeholder initiatives really come down to is creating a parallel system of corporate-friendly soft law. Um, so, you know, then all of these standards exist. The next step is that, um, sorry. The next step is those standards are then verified by auditors. And what that means, those auditors' job is to fly into a site often, spend one day, maybe less, maybe two days if it's like good and thorough, and run down a checklist to ensure compliance. And you know, then I think it's important to think about where the money goes in all of this. That auditing industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's also projected to grow something like 17% in the next couple of years. Private equity is investing in these auditing firms now. Like it is 
an entire set of corporate practice or entities in and of itself. Um, right, so there's a lot of money interested in holding this system up. So then, you know, certifiers, the ones who set the standards, then that you see on the label, they charge brands licensing fees to put those logos on products. Uh, so you can see where, right, like all these pieces of money goes. Um, and, you know, uh, I left out one key piece, suppliers. They then pay auditing fees to the auditors. And, you know, you'll see a lot on auditing companies' websites that talk a lot about how they are a neutral third party. But there's research showing how this model where suppliers pay auditors actually really creates conflicts of interest for getting good results out of an audit. So when you look overall at this system of certification, we really see that at every step, the system is not set up to incentivize human rights. Um, Liana talked some yesterday about research published by um, MSI Integrity out of Harvard Law, looking at the failures of these multi-stakeholder initiatives and enumerating the ways that they fail to live up to the human rights promises that they make. And I would say in addition to that, it's not just that these certifications and auditing regimes are failing to protect workers and their basic human rights, they're actually helping to undermine them. Um, before I joined the network, I worked as a uh, watchdog of ethical labels, and there was this trend that I kept seeing. You would have a labor uprising, and then there would be suddenly a new certification showing up on a product that yesterday Maggie Gray was talking about the amazing organizing that New York, New York farm workers did to pass the Farm Laborers Fair Labor Practice Act in New York. And just as those newly minted legal protections came on the scene, so too did a new certification promising fair trade dairy and protections for worker well-being. The only problem, it was actively opposed by the workers themselves, well, it was actively opposed by the organizers of those workers. The workers themselves didn't even know it was happening. Two years into the program, did not know. Last week, I co-published a report with an academic who'd done over 200 interviews with workers in Mexico's San Quentin Valley, where a vast amount of the produce in the United States comes from. And he'd done interviews on farms bearing two of the most common labels in the US marketplace. And the findings were grim, that there was, you know, not only were wage theft and abuses up to and including forced labor widespread on those plantations, the workers on those sites who knew that the certifications were there identified them as actually fulfilling the same function in their workplace as the company unions that are ubiquitous on those farms. So I would say it's not just that these multi-stakeholder initiatives are failing to protect workers, they're actually propping up the very power imbalances that are at the root of the abuses we see. And I think this is really concerning and obviously the fact that it's a recurring theme across so many people's presentations um, is evidence that we're, many of us are seeing this and are concerned about this trend. And you know, I think we keep decrying it as basically corporate PR, but I think we need to pay close attention to what's happening. That I would caution that these certifications and the MSIs that back them up are not just corporate PR. They're at real risk of being written into our regulatory systems that we see in the EU that there is a push for corporate due diligence regulations and certification and auditing are really on the table as um, aspects of compliance. And in the US, you know, you see certifiers promoting themselves as tools for corporations to meet their ESG goals. So I think, you know, combating corporate PR, totally just a standard part of corporate campaigning, right? But I would argue that what we're talking about here is more than just corporate PR. It's really a proposal that corporations and their allied initiatives are the ones to best regulate themselves. So that big de detour brings us to worker-driven social responsibility. If corporate social responsibility whoa, is about um, 
If corporate social responsibility is about corporations protecting their interests, worker-driven social responsibility is led by workers and prioritizes protecting their human rights. And you know, I think I talked through that long list of okay, financial incentives, how those come out in favor of corporations. I think it's important to reiterate here, well, who are workers beholden to? Who, what is their interest? And once and again, they are the ones with the abiding interest in protecting their own human rights. Um, yeah, so since I was talking about Nike there, I'll keep going in that same industry for a minute. In the garment industry, worker unions there reached a critical diagnosis, which was that the low wages and incredibly dangerous conditions that they were facing were not just the choices of a few bad bosses. Instead, they recognized that what they were living was the result of the purchasing practices at the top of supply chains. And that's a story that's set in the apparel industry, but that reality of long value chains, corporations at the top setting conditions at the bottom through their purchasing practices is true across many industries. And that diagnosis is shared by those programs that I put up on the second slide. Uh, so that's you know the basics of those um, worker-driven social responsibility programs. Uh, once again, I think in the US, we often use the term worker-driven social responsibility. Um, when you see it in international contexts, they're often talking about binding enforceable agreements. Uh, often, those are mostly the same things. Um, but that all brings us to campaigning. Um, I'm not going to get into this deeply because I feel like it's much more interestingly illustrated, not at the principal's level, but via all the individual programs who've talked about their successes. Uh, yeah. All right. So this brings us to campaigning. And I'm going to run through a few campaigns that are currently actively campaigning for what would be uh, worker-driven social responsibility programs when implemented. So I'm going to start with apparel talk briefly about the construction industry, and then end right here in the northeastern US talking a little bit about dairy. So the Worker-Driven Social Responsibility Network is a key US campaign partner in the Pay Your Workers campaign, which is a global coalition of 280 unions, human rights organizations, and others. And this campaign came about because back at the beginning of the pandemic, when garment, garment brands started slashing orders or refusing orders that had already been made and really pushing as much of the risk and cost of the global crisis back onto suppliers. And so factories were laying off workers in this snowballing crisis, right? Garment workers, they already were receiving super low wages. So, you know, they lose their job, they don't have a cushion. And factories are often on a somewhat of a similar shoestring, right? Everyone was getting squeezed by these brands. And suppliers were laying off workers without severance, pay payment that they were, in fact, legally owed. And what's the saying, right? Like, never let a good crisis go to waste. That was definitely then what happened, with suppliers then taking advantage of that situation to lay off the troublesome workers, the union organizers. All of this was happening in violation of brands' various codes of conduct, not to mention local law. So, Pay Your Workers campaign then was developed. It has key, two key elements. One is getting brands to take responsibility for the consequences of their purchasing practices and pay out to cover the wages that workers in their supply chains are owed. And then to prevent this from ever happening again, to get these brands to sign on to binding agreements that include labor rights protections and then a global severance fund for workers if there is another global crisis. And I think we've already seen more global crises happen um, since that time. This campaign has then been very successful on the first point. It's now recouped over $10 million in counting for garment workers in back wages. And um, yeah, so that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit. But um, I think. You know, I would argue that one of the key aspects then of outsourcing is not just to move to lower wage, lower regulatory environments, but to disappear the resulting abuses. So out of sight, out of mind, right? 
one of the key aspects of the Pay Your Workers campaign has been to really make those distant supply chain abuses a real problem for the brands at the top of their supply chains. So where I live in Portland, Oregon, is the home of Adidas North America headquarters. And Adidas is a supplier linked to the largest supply chain wage theft, which is $11.7 million from workers. Um, what you see here is a demonstration we had earlier this year. We turned out the local machinist unions, Starbucks workers, as well as local community members, um, all outside of Adidas headquarters. And we kept showing up, disrupting events where the Adidas CEO was speaking and bringing together more members of the community to really drive home the point that Adidas cannot hide the consequences of their purchasing practices overseas. Um, and then a key piece of building that momentum has been student organizing. Um, since the early days of anti-sweatshop activism, student power has been really key. As Liana described yesterday, universities have licensing agreements with brands like Adidas and Nike to produce their branded apparel. And students organizing in solidarity with garment workers has historically been a key pressure point to leverage in terms of for, um, enforcing those licensing agreements. So it's not just an issue of like individual consumer choice, but really about leveraging these multi-million dollar contracts that universities hold with brands. What you see here is a delegation of students that we took to Cambodia this summer where they got to learn from and strategize with uh, garment worker unions. And that's really the essence of this work, right? Is to bring together the global and the local, to put pressure on these companies where it matters to them, and bring them to the table to then sign binding agreements with worker organizations. Um, in my minimalism, I don't actually have a slide, but another campaign that's happening right now for a worker-driven social responsibility program is being led by our members at Satul in Minneapolis. And they organize with wor low-wage workers there a lot of people working in the construction industry. And well, the common perception of construction is you know, the historically unionized trades. There is a lot of construction, especially smaller apartments and residential homes that's non-union. And the value chain actually turns out to have a lot in common with these other industries that we've been talking about, right? So extremely exploited workers at the bottom, layers and layers of subcontractors obscuring accountability, and then at the top, developers whose purchasing practices, or in this case, contracting practices, set the tone for what happens on the job site. But there's just one issue that they face. Can anybody name the largest developer in the United States? Hmm? Yeah, right? True. Okay, so that is exactly the problem, right? The answer is Lennar Homes, but a room of very smart people had no idea. And that's a big issue in this campaign, right? Like when CIW says, we are campaigning on Taco Bell back in the day, like everybody knows Taco Bell, they have a sensory experience of Taco Bell, they know where it is on their block, right? Construction does not have that immediate brand recognition. So what that means is that one of the paths that this campaign is taking is exploring you know, how to use various public policy levers to win, to encourage or push developers into signing a binding agreement with a worker's organization. Um, so finally, I am going to talk about some really interesting campaigning happening right here in this region. Over in Vermont, our members at Migrant Justice have been campaigning to bring the Hannaford supermarkets into their Milk with Dignity program, which is an adaptation of the WSR model for dairy. And Kate's gonna talk a minute about the details of what that program looks like, where it's currently being implemented. But on the theme of campaigning, I think one of the things that's really important here, really critical, is you have farm workers here in Maine and Vermont, right? And they are living in dangerous and abusive conditions. And they recognize that the conditions that they're experiencing aren't just a problem with the farm that they work on, but are part of a wider crisis in dairy. And they decided that they wanted to address that with the company who buys milk at the top of the supply chain. And that company is Hannaford, their local supermarket. Except when you march down the street to call in that local Hannaford store, the store is actually owned by Ahel Del Hayes, 
the 12th largest food, food retailer in the world based out of the Netherlands. And so, you know, that's some of the work that we do as a network is we have connections with campaigners in Europe. We have the capacity to get together some of the different levers that can be used to take on corporations at such, such scale. And we use them to build more places where workers can win. And so I think I'll wrap up here just by pointing out that worker-driven social responsibility as a model continues to adapt itself to the realities that workers see in their workplaces. And those workplaces are increasingly ones where the immediate boss you see in front of you or even the one in the corporate office up the road is not the one with the money and power to really meet your demands. And so what do we do about this? If we live in a world where workers campaigning for their basic rights have to take on multinational corporations, we need to have global strategies. And those strategies need to be worker-driven from their local contexts. And so that's really the space that the network aims to create, that we work to bring those learnings from one group of workers to another and bring people together around a shared analysis. So I think I'm out of time. And I'll... Um, oh yeah, because you can't really. Well, aquí estamos. Ni modo. Can you hear me okay? Okay, maybe I'll turn it off. I'll leave it off, but let me know. Like if people online say that they can't hear. Okay, I'll stay exactly. Um, thank you everybody for coming, and thank you for holding out until the last panel. Made it. Um. So the Milk with Dignity Standards Council is, as Anna said, a technical advisor to the Worker-Driven Social Responsibility Network and was founded by Migrant Justice based on the experience of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers in founding the Fair Food Standards Council. So I'll try not to be repetitive about the principles of WSR and how standards councils monitor conditions. Rather, I'll talk a little bit about the way this work happens in this part of the country and the particularities of the dairy industry to which our work is tailored. I've got here a picture of the signing of NAFTA, a picture of a Japaneko farmer, and a picture of a Vermont dairy sign. Um, Vermont's rocky soil is primarily good for grazing, and the state was built on the wool trade until the 20th century. Since then, dairy has been a primary driver of Vermont's economy. It controls the majority of our farmland and produces $2 billion in revenue every year. For reference, that's more than skiing. Um, according to the Vermont Council on Rural Development, no other state has a single commodity that accounts for such a high percentage of its agricultural sales. So a key central driver of the state's economy. But behind the glossy brochures of red barns and Holstein cows and white men in overalls is an industry held up by an invisibilized labor force of undocumented workers. In Vermont and northern New York, where the MDSC also works, most immigrant dairy workers were born in Chiapas, southern Mexico, or Central America. Patrick mentioned the other night that the OPEC strike and resulting recession in 73 drove a lot of migration from Mexico. These were also farming communities decimated by NAFTA in 94 and CAFTA in 2005. The effects of NAFTA on smallholders in Mexico is well known, from US corn subsidies that made it impossible to make a living growing corn in Mexico and turn the country that invented corn into a net importer, to the erasure of state aid and credit for small farmers, to the imposition of Article 27 and the elimination of collective landholding, paving the way for the consolidation of the agricultural sector. In the first 15 years of NAFTA, 2 million Mexican farmers lost their livelihoods, with the income of a farm laborer dropping by two thirds. Between 94 and 2000, the annual number of Mexicans leaving for the United States more than doubled. The Mexican dairy industry saw consolidation as lower cost milk solids imported from the US undercut the profits of smaller farms. Zapatista organizers in Chiapas called the passage of NAFTA a summary execution for indigenous communities in Southern Mexico 
Thousands of people traveled north and crossed the border into the United States to find work, and many landed on farms, even as far north as Vermont. You probably can't see these numbers very well, um, which doesn't matter too much. I'll just tell you that in the years following NAFTA, U.S. dairy products, including milk from Vermont farms, were exported to Mexico at exponential rates, with as much powdered milk from the U.S. now sold in Mexico as is sold in the U.S. itself. About a day's volume per seven-day week of milk production in the U.S. is now exported, most of it to Mexico. And milk prices for farmers rose at least a little bit with the volume of exports. Vermont Dairy exported an average of about, of about $11 million worth to Mexico per year through about 2018, mostly in milk solids and whey protein. During the same years, while native-born labor was harder and harder to find, they also increasingly hired immigrant labor. So you can see in this first chart that some 25% of U.S. milk exports go to Mexico and how um, that jumped after, after NAFTA, with 2014 being the highest year for, for milk prices, too, and also for exports. However, the price of milk has been falling. It's hovered around $20 or $21 per hundredweight this year, with half of that going to feed costs, what the inputs into the cows. That's compared to almost $26 in 2014, and it dipped significantly in the years between. So this ends up leading to, probably can't see the text on this either, but it uh, leads to consolidation in the Vermont dairy industry. This newly available labor force and profits from exports were not enough to protect Vermont dairies from the same kind of economic forces that had forced Mexican farmers to, quote, go big or go home. The nationwide consolidation in dairy has hit Vermont as hard as anywhere else, with more and more farmers forced to sell their cows. Um, the Census of Agriculture chart shows just the, the difference between 1978 and 2017 in the size of dairy farms in Vermont. Um, and you can see now that, that most of the farms have more than 500 cows. Hardly anybody anymore has, has just a handful of cows. Only the, the big ones can survive. <clears throat> there are now 73% as many cow dairies in Vermont as there were five years ago, half as many as there were 10 years ago, 5% as many as there were 75 years ago, and those that remain have to get bigger. Even organic buyers, whom you would suspect of being loyal to the Vermont brand, are increasingly buying from bigger farms in the Midwest. Milk prices that drop below the cost of production place downward pressure on dairy farmers and therefore on their workers. Come on. Oh, you know what? I tried to do it through the metal. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs> In 2009, one of those workers was killed in Vermont. This is not his picture. Um, <clears throat> a young Chapman worker named Jose Obeth was pulled into a gutter scraper and strangled. A gutter scraper is a machine that's used to push cow manure into a hole, pulled across the barn floor by a cable or a chain attached to an open motorized pulley. Gutter scrapers are one of the many dangerous elements of dairy work, alongside being injured or killed by cows or bulls, tractors rolling over with no cabs or seat belts, repeated exposure to formaldehyde and other chemicals used to clean cows' hooves, or accidentally falling into manure pits, which are deep lagoons that look like solid mud, but are more like quicksand, and can asphyxiate or drown a worker who has been tasked with pushing manure into it with a skid steer, often without a fence, a barrier, or a warning sign anywhere in sight. Maggie Gray documented in 2016 that between 20, 2006 and 2016 in New York State alone, there were 61 deaths on dairy farms. Thank you, Maggie, for that research. As several presenters have already made clear, U.S. law excludes farm workers from many health, health and safety and labor protections. Those laws that do include them are not enforced. This piece was published in ProPublica last week about Wisconsin dairy farms, reporting that Congress prohibits OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, from enforcing safety laws on farms with fewer than 11 workers unless they have a temporary labor camp. The fact that dairy workers are almost always housed on the farm itself, and sometimes even in the barn with the cows, is occasionally enough to prompt an investigation. But the fact that dairy work is year-round and not temporary makes this cloudy. 
Moreover, because most farms have milking machines, large crews are not needed, and the, only the biggest dairies have 11 or more workers. This leaves dairy workers as a class with no effective regulatory apparatus, even after a worker is killed. Jose Obeth's death in 2009 galvanized the community of farm workers in the region who adapted the organizing principles of the Zapatistas to form migrant justice. Workers with migrant justice, after an exchange with the CIW, wrote the Milk, of Dignity Code of, Milk with Dignity Code of Conduct based on their experiences and needs in the workplace and created us, the Milk with Dignity Standards Council, as an independent nonprofit dedicated to monitoring and enforcing the standards in that worker-driven code. Farms are paid a premium on their milk for compliance with the code of conduct, and part of that premium is passed on to workers in the form of a monthly bonus, modeled after other WSR programs. But work on Vermont dairy has particularities that differ from other kinds of agricultural labor. Cows, of course, do not take breaks from needing to be milked, and today's cows are milked two to three times in every 24-hour period to maximize production. This means workers are often working overnight, and that workers on farms outside of the Milk with Dignity program often have less than eight hours to rest between shifts. The small size of most farms means workers are working side by side with the owner, who often does some of the same work in the day to day. But the size of the farms also makes it difficult for workers to take vacation and especially sick leave because they know that it usually means that one of their compas will have to cover their shift. Latinx workers are isolated on the farms, particularly if the crew is small. Farms are miles away from one another or from the nearest grocery store. In an overwhelmingly white state, workers stand out and almost all the farms are within 100 miles of the Canadian border. From some of them, you can see Canada. Workers often fear traveling off the farm because of encounters with border patrol and ICE and depend on the farmer's family or a paid ride to get them groceries or take care of their needs. Right now, our program is comparatively small, especially as compared to the FFSC, although it co does cover 20% of the state's dairy industry. This means that our team has lots of contact with each worker in between audits and education sessions. Finally, one other particularity is that because of the state's demographics, with a few exceptions, farmers almost never speak Spanish. So a good chunk of our work involves interpreting and facilitating communication. At the program education sessions we hold on each participating farm, farmers are usually in the room with workers when we talk about rights and responsibilities under the code of conduct. Farmers wear headsets for simultaneous interpretation. And I will tell you it is a powerful thing to see farmers sit quietly while workers are educated about their rights. And often by the end of the session, workers have asked the farmer directly to their face to raise wages or fix something in the housing or the work site or the farmer has had a chance to raise a challenge in the work site with workers that they can then strategize about together. Um, and here I have listed just the elements of the program which you should also already be familiar with um, from yesterday. Our farm worker code of conduct, worker to worker education, MDSCs, we are the third party monitoring body as part of the MD program. Um, it uses market consequences to enforce the code and uses economic relief to enforce the code. Um, and we have legally, Migrant Justice has legally binding agreements with corporate buyers that then we monitor and enforce. Um, our code of conduct starts with compliance with existing applicable laws, goes through a period of fair wages, a section on dignified schedules and rest, protection from retaliation and discrimination, health and safety protections, quality housing, and protection from zero tolerance violations like forced and child labor, sexual and physical violence, um, and specific retaliation against workers for making use of the Milk with Dignity Standards Council. Milk with Dignity currently serves 50, some 52, I think, last I counted, farms with over 200 workers. During the last calendar year, we took in more than 300 inquiries on our 24-hour bilingual support line. 25 of them related to uh, workplace health and safety. 22% uh, to wages and related issues. 12% to schedules and rest. 18% to housing conditions. Since the launch of the program in 2017, we've actually received more than 1,500 such calls. I think it says 1,400 here because I hadn't counted this year. So it's probably a little bit higher. 
More than $4.4 million from corporate buyers has supported farms' improvements to working and housing conditions, including $2.9 million in raises to meet minimum wage, and almost $1.5 million in bonuses, paid vacation and sick time, housing improvements, new PPE, and other safety measures. We have worked with Migrant Justice to host almost 300 education sessions and worked with farmers to draft and translate personnel policies, translate safety pro posters and chemical handling instructions, work through disputes, improve new worker training, help facilitate workers' comp claims, facilitate on-site on COVID vaccines at farms, marshal state and private funding to help construct new zero energy worker housing on farms, help foster communication between workers and farmers, prevent and quickly address sexual harassment and assault, and transmit safety protocols and mitigate risks. Farmers give us lots of feedback. Let me just see what else I put in here. This is stuff I already talked about, I think. Um, farmers tend to give us lots of feedback on our monitoring and enforcement, and some of it is critical, which is normal and expected, but they by and large point to the benefits of the program. Two comments that farmers have made that always stuck with me are one saying, I can go to sleep saying I'm doing the right thing and the people who are working for me are okay. Second one is, the program premium might make the difference between us still having a farm a year from now or not. MDSC is a worker-driven program, and so the most important feedback for us comes from workers. Marcela is a longtime dairy worker who worked on the same farm before Milk with Dignity and then afterward. She says, once the farm joined Milk with Dignity, the boss became more concerned about us, about our well-being. He's more tolerant now. Instead of scolding us when something goes wrong, he communicates patiently. There have been times in the past when I've suffered discrimination because I'm a woman, but we have a voice now and we feel secure. We can work with dignity because we know we have the program support. It's very important that Milk with Dignity exists. Um, this is our little team of auditors on an audit a couple of weeks ago. Milk with Dignity currently works with one corporate buyer. Migrant Justice is in the process of campaigning for additional buyers to join the program, and we are outside of that campaign. Our work is an example of what happens when you win a hard-fought campaign, which takes years of insistence and public pressure until it benefits the buyer more to join you than to refuse you. But campaigns also don't end when you win, and the implementation plan with each new buyer is key to achieve the success that the campaign proposes. We look forward to working with new buyers after each successful campaign, and the rise of Milk with Dignity is a powerful example of the way that the WSR model can be adapted to particular contexts, industries of different sizes, in different parts of the world, adapted to the way that people live and work in each industry. A successful program benefits three parties. It benefits corporate buyers, when we can make their bottom lines depend on the documented lack of worker abuses in their supply chains. It benefits farmers who see reduced risk, better communication, and premiums paid from the people who hold the economic resources, and it benefits workers who see up close and personal what's happening on each farm, and as Judge Laura said yesterday, are empowered to decide whether or not the farms have access to the market to sell their product. Um, and the last point I will make is that we are hiring. <laughs> so feel free to check out our website and come join our team. Thank you all so much for your attention. Thank you for another great panel. Um, so now we can open this up for discussion and I've been enjoying the format of taking a couple questions, maybe one online if there's one available, but why don't we just take a couple to start off with. What, no. Okay. Um, I had a couple of questions um, for Anna and Kate. Um, so uh, I was curious about how, I know the two of you are somewhat newish around, uh, around this, but certainly not around these issues. So I'm curious about how you feel like worker-led social responsibility has changed and the lessons you've learned along the way. And Kate, I wonder about, um, how is it to try to support the program and raise money for the program and all that when it's 200 workers? And we know how important that is, like in terms of the dairy industry and all that, but um, just as somebody who has to raise money all the time from foundations and from 
you know, et cetera, when you say 200 workers, they're like, yeah. you know. Um, so I'm curious about how you've been handling it and have you been struggling to get other corporations into the program? And um, like Ben & Jerry's is such a well-known brand that it's like easier to bring pressure on them. I'm curious about what it's like to do that with other brands. Um, Anna, I was just going to say to you, you talked about the biggest housing developer and how we didn't know who it was and, um, and it's residential housing and all that. Um, how have you found uh, it possible to bring pressure to bear on that company as well? Great. Thank you. Let me take a question from Jerry. Um, Jerry Epstein. Uh, thanks for a great panel. I have a question for Claudia. Um, um, uh, thank you for your presentation. I wanted to know um, who you see as uh, local um, supporters, local allies in the various fights. So for example, local public officials, um, other workers, organizations, um, who in the, in the Valley um, are, are supporting your work? Okay, I'll take one more from Bob. Uh, yeah, Bob Poland, again, great uh, panel overall. Thank you very, very much. So I wanted to ask about, and uh, it came up specifically in Kate's talk, but I think it applies more generally also to Anna and Claudia. Is um, uh, Kate, uh, you referred to the uh, model working because uh, you there are market consequences and economic costs, and uh, I wanted to know a little bit more how that works, and then to generalize off of that a little bit. Um, actually, at the, in the early days of the uh, WRC, I myself was uh, working with the WRC, and we uh, ended up writing some papers on, on exactly this issue of uh, the costs, and uh, you know the argument being, well, if we do this, that's all well and good, but you know it's going to cost a lot, and, and the consumers don't want to pay the extra cost. So the thing that I actually did research on with uh, coworkers was to show that the costs actually were minimal, uh, moving up to the su supply chain. So I'm wondering, yeah, to what extent that is part of your discussion. Great. Okay, so I'll let the panelists take turns at those questions. This is on, yep. right? Great. Um, anybody want to start? Um, Get a comment. Yeah. Okay. I'll start, and then we'll pass it around. Um, thank you for those those good questions. I will start with Janice talked about: um, Is it hard to raise money and raise awareness for you know 200, 250 workers? It isn't. Um, Luckily, we are blessed to not have that problem, I don't think. Part of it, I think, is that Vermont, uh, for the last five, maybe 10 years, has been undergoing a pretty rapid demographic shift. It doesn't seem like it from outside, but we see it happening. Um, and there has been a lot of attention paid to that in the state. Um, you know, state funding is increasingly forthcoming for immigrant communities, foundations are who have historically funded, you know, progressive work in Vermont are are paying more attention to to the needs of immigrant populations right now, so that's that's been been great. Um, you know, and the other thing is that uh, it's not just workers who benefit from the program, so they're not the only story we need to tell. Farmers have also not received enough support um, in recent years, and and so you know the 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 reason I talk about the program as a win 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 is because farmers also benefit materially um, from participation in the program. Um, is it hard to bring corporate buyers other than Ben and Jerry's into the program? So I'm, I'm not involved in the campaign with Hannaford. I have no role there. We have to be independent from that in order to just monitor and enforce. Um, but I do have an understanding of how the campaign with Ben and Jerry's went. And despite Ben and Jerry's image, it actually wasn't easy. It took years. Um, so I think you know every campaign can take years, no matter what the sort of public you know, perception is of a, of a corporation. Um, and then market consequences. The market consequences, and other WSR practitioners can speak to this as well, the market consequences for farms are that when they're in the program, they receive a premium for their milk, and workers get to decide if they keep receiving it. 
Right, so workers, if, if there's enough of a problem on the farm that cannot be resolved through many attempts, and I'll say we work really hard to keep farms in the program, um, but if we reach the point that that doesn't work and we are forced to put a, a farm on probation or suspend them, then you know the worker-driven code of conduct determines whether or not the farm has access to the market. So it's a market consequence of not being able to um, meet the you know the exigencies of of the code of conduct that we enforce. Claudia. Gracias. Bueno, la primera pregunta. Eh, de los, los que nos apoyan a nosotros, más que todo está el representante Carlos González, está el senador Adán Gómez, está la coalición de Claudia Quintero y también tenemos organizaciones que ha, se han sumado en este año eh, para poder pasar esta ley. Some of the individuals and coalitions that have helped us the most are Senator Carlos Gonzalez in Massachusetts, and also, oh, sorry, Representative Carlos Gonzalez and Senator Adam Gomez, as well as a broader coalition, and also the organization of, of Claudia Quintero, which is the Central Westest, West Justice Center, and other organizations in Massachusetts. Bueno, y con la segunda pregunta, eh, lo que yo pienso que no debería de subir el precio de, de las ventas de los productos. Eh, nosotros lo que queremos realmente, cuando yo hable de eliminar el sueldo submínimo del libro del Estado de Massachusetts, es que me imagino que el empleador gana lo suficiente como para poder dar un salario digno a los trabajadores, no necesariamente tiene que ser a 10 por hora. Y sé que algunos finqueros están pagando más, pero si ellos quisieran podrían pagar menos y no habría ninguna represalia porque según el estado de Massachusetts es a 8. Entonces no creo que esto va a subir el precio de, de los productos. Y si nosotros vemos, hay hasta productos orgánicos eh, donde están bien vendidos, entonces... El empleador supongo que tiene suficiente, nada más que no quiere pagarle más a los, a los trabajadores esenciales, pero no creo que esto los va a afectar a las personas en, en los productos que compramos. Our perspective is that the sales price of um, food products doesn't need to increase if the sub, when we talk about eliminating the subminimum wage in Massachusetts, um, it is possible for workers to earn enough and to have a dignified wage. Um, we think that the boss is already making enough money and we think therefore it is really possible for the farms that are only paying $10 an hour or those that are paying just a little bit more than $10 an hour to increase the wages all the way to $15 an hour hour and to do so without exploiting workers um, and while they're continuing to sell organic products if you look at these workers especially as essential workers and how the boss can still handle this on their balance sheets given the higher profits that the boss is bringing in um. That was a lot of varied, very varied questions. Um, I think there was one specifically around how actually um, Satul was bringing pressure on Lennar. Um, they've actually, that is not one of their key campaign targets at this point. They are going after local developers who are then campaigning or who are building in their local um, region. So that was just an example of how that industry is shaped and who the big players are, that it functions very differently without big players. Um, to the questions around how WSR has changed and lessons along the way, um, <laughs> I don't know that I'm the greatest person to answer that, honestly, in a room full of people who have a lot of experience implementing these programs that I feel like a lot of the lessons that are learned within the programs are very specific and one of the lessons that has been learned along the way is how to keep socializing those lessons and seeding them with new programs so that those new programs get to build and you know i think that's such a challenge for so many of our movements is that <laughs> we are continually kind of reinventing the wheel and i think we do a lot to try within our little group to keep on building 
Okay, great. Well, we have a question online, so I'm gonna read this question online and then take a couple more questions from the audience. Um, this is from Alicia. Uh, thank you all. Anna, you talked about the danger related to human rights due diligence laws, including elements of certification and other reg self-regulation approaches. Do you think human rights due diligence laws are doomed, or is there a possibility to integrate WSR elements into the laws? How do you think that would work? So let me gather a couple more questions, and then we'll, we'll take panelists. So I just, um, this is less of a question than a, a tack on to Anna's response about how WSR has changed. And I think it, the fact that we're sitting here in this conference is, is a testimony to how it has changed. Because one of the very first things that was set forth as a goal when we sat in this kind of dark room with like WRC and a couple of other allies, Nasri at that time, uh, you know, it was, it was a handful of people who came together to talk about one of the things we talked uh, most about in addition to helping new practitioners um, by, you know, having them come and embed with, with existing programs, which at that time really only were uh, uh, what the Fair Food Program and, and the Accord, um, was a fight for hearts and minds. And... Uh, research like the piece that Anna just published is critical. I would urge people to read it. I don't know why you didn't call out the names, but they're household names. EFI, Fair Trade, these are household names. And this part of, this, part of the goal that we set ourselves is that the worker-driven social responsibility model would become, and the, and the, <clears throat> the names of the programs that employ that model would also become household names. And I just, you know, it, it, sitting from where we were sitting then, it seemed impossible. I remember when CIW started to use the phrase worker-driven social responsibility, we were like, well, is that something people will actually understand and talk about? But now look at us, we're here. And just one last thing, uh, you know, as a, I always like to, to have hope, you know, going forward and coming out of these experiences. Yes, the Hannaford campaign is tough. Yes, the campaign that the compañeros here in Massachusetts are waging is tough. Say Tools campaign is tough. But, you know, the elements of worker-driven social responsibility were laid when CIW launched its Taco Bell campaign. I mean, let's not forget that, 2001. And they went out to an intersection in the middle of Fort Myers and said, Taco Bell makes farm workers poor. That was not a catchy slogan, you know? <laughs> but like, but like, look at us, you know, look at us now and look at how the demands that we're in and that got embedded in the Taco Bell uh, agreement in 2005. Now they're embedded in every worker-driven social responsibility program. Those elements and the ones that Kate, you know, I felt, I'm sorry, it's like, I felt like this maternal pride here, you know, you're getting up there and you're, you know, it's talking about all the things that are being employed uh, in Vermont, um, you know, and, and that Vermont's like our offspring in a way. So anyway, it is just, we are here and the fact that, that we are here, that there are more programs, that there are more programs on the runway in the fishing industry, in the UK, in the sam possibly salmon in Chile, uh, who knows where the next one will be. Um, but that is how things have changed. And it's the work of you all, the people who write about this stuff, who study about it, and who practice it, that are gonna make it that household word. So. Okay, any more questions? Sorry, also if I can build off Judge Laura because I'm involved in the WSR fishing pilot um, and I know that one's evolving a bit differently and Greg can jump in. But I think something that is very interesting is you all talked about, or Anna talked about, um, fair trade, et cetera. And we have retailers at the table. I mean, we're not in the hard bit yet, but we're in vessel owners as well. And one of the reasons is vessel owners have also expressed how they've been harmed by um, some of these social certifications. Uh, and so I think that that's also um, sort of a uh, credit to the work like you do, Anna, of calling out some of the harms of CSR. And uh, I, I mean, I wasn't around in the beginning of the fair food program. I was little, um, but <laughs> not that little. Um, 
<laughs> no, but um, I, to me, that seems like something that's been very different is how early we had some of these other actors at the table and part of the evolution of it. Okay, I'm going to abuse my power to ask a couple questions and then we'll take comments from the panelists. Um, I had a question for Claudia. Um, something that was mentioned yesterday was that there's a lot of direct-to-consumer um, market, there's a large market share of direct-to-consumer um, uh, sales in Massachusetts or in our area in particular, and I was wondering if that is an advantage in any of your campaigns or something you can use strategically. And then I had a question for Kate. Uh, I thought it was really interesting, this dynamic of having, the, you were talking about how small the workforces are on these farms and how owners are often working side by side uh, with their workers, and I was wondering if that, I can imagine it both helping and hurting the uh, ability for workers to um, organize. So I was, was curious about what that dynamic, how that affects the organizing efforts of workers. So I'll, again, panelists, take questions in the order that you feel most comfortable. Bueno, sí es una ventaja porque estamos hablando sobre la campaña que les mencioné para el 2024 de tener un baño digno para los trabajadores. Eh, hay maneras de presionar a, a los lugares eh, donde nosotros somos consumidores de la manera que podemos ir a ver las etiquetas y hablar directamente con el empleador. Y esa es una parte que todos los consumidores podrían apoyarnos eh, si un día nosotros llega, llevamos la campaña y ellos dicen, vamos a poner presión, no vamos a comprar de este lugar. Imagínense que si ustedes no saben, decimos, de tal finca traen el producto, pero no tienen un baño digno y van a decir, ¿cómo estamos comprando? Y los trabajadores no tienen lo que merecen. Vamos a decir, no vamos a comprar aquí, los vamos a poner en huelga. Es una manera de presionar para que ellos puedan ganar esa campaña. Así que siento que en eso sí tenemos una ventaja. Um, yes, I do think there is some advantage to the um, advantage that are some benefit to the advantage that we can have here of selling directly to consumers. So we're thinking, for example, with our campaign for next year, 2024, on achieving restrooms on the farms, that there could be ways to we could build pressure also in the spaces where people are consumers in Western Massachusetts and talking about look at the label and talk directly to the owner of the farm. And that's ways that people could support us as consumers. And it's really um, creating the difference and showing the difference of you know maybe buy from here, not from here. Let's support places that are actually providing restroom facilities rather than those that aren't, and maybe that could connect to you know some form of a boycott type of pressure. Thank you, Claudia. Um, Yes, in terms of small workforces on farms, workers working side by side with workers, is this an advantage or a disadvantage to organizing? Um, keeping in mind that the, the farms that I have interactions with are all inside of our program already, um, I, I see it more often as an advantage than a disadvantage, although I would be interested in what the workers would say about that. I think probably on farms that are not yet in the Milk with Dignity program, this would present potentially a barrier, right? I mean, on, on a small farm, there's a lot of rhetoric about, well, you know, these workers are my family, this farm is a family. And that may be true, but not every family is a healthy model of equity. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that that can be an issue. Um, at the same time, I mean, I, I, I wish you could see these education sessions where the farmers and the workers are looking at each other and speaking through simultaneous headset translation. Oftentimes, it's like the farmers will come into the program feeling reticent, feeling trepidatious, feeling outright resistance to the program. And after being able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with workers, you know, many of whom come from families that face some of the same economic dynamics that farmers are now facing, years and generations ago, um, there, is, there is a moment you know, where that communication can be really fruitful and really productive for uh, things being improved on the farm, even if it's a small thing in the day-to-day, -day, like 
you know, the gutter scraper's broken. It's a small conversation. Maybe it saved a life, you know? Um, so those are really a nice part of the work. All right. I think there was a question. The note I wrote was, is human rights due diligence doomed? Is that the, yes. was that actually the question? <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, I never like to say something is doomed, especially if it hasn't even come into possibility yet. I think, right, there's risks. Um, anytime something comes into law, it can be something you can use to leverage and win more things for workers, or it can also um, prop up bad systems. And so it's hard to forecast which way that will go, especially because that is happening in Europe. I mean, I think that what we do see is the things that the folks around working around WSR have been calling for for decades now is really becoming more mainstream in conversations around business and human rights. So having workers as rights holders, having them at the center of conversations, and ha holding corporations responsible for the consequences of their purchasing practices. I think that WSR is really well positioned to support companies in compliance with that sort of regulation in that you know, the emphasis within the program is not just on, you know, helping to cover up things that have happened, but prevention. And then, you know, access to remedy for workers. So whether that looks like, you know, Judge Laura, I think, was talking yesterday about apologies from farm owners or then fixing material conditions, things that are broken. Um, all of those things are really access to remedy for workers. Um, and you know, I think that there's some really interesting things that some of our members have been doing as the regulatory environment has changed in Europe, that there is currently a lawsuit moving forward under the German supply chain law that was passed, um, actually suing IKEA, Amazon, and a third brand I cannot think of off the top of my head um, for having failed to sign the International Safety Accord. And that case is making the case that they have failed to do their due diligence, that they know that there are, that you know everybody knows Bangladeshi garment factories, very dangerous, at risk of all the fire safety things that Liana talked about yesterday. So those companies have, been put on notice, they have not done something to it. So I think that that's an example of ways that that legislation can be leveraged in the future. Great, thank you. So, we, oh, great, more questions, let me pass the mic. <laughs> um, so thanks to everybody for the amazing panel and for the trajectory of the conversation over this week uh, about WSR, I have a question, and it's, I think, a hard question about the next steps, like what comes next. And so the first one is, is there a pathway to union organizing? And I know this like crops up in places where a union is not practical or not possible because right to work laws or uh, in fishing, it's uh, pretty challenging. But, but still, it seems like, you know, can this uh, lead to an actual union with a collective bargaining agreement, which it seems like this is like a patch, it, it, it's a response to the failure of labor laws to make unions possible and um, practical. And then the second piece is, can it lead to legislation? And this is, I think, related to what you were just talking about, Anna, in terms of EU due diligence, which, you know, I, I get it, the, uh, I've been in a lot of meetings, t discussion about it, and how, you know, the, the legislation gets watered down many times as it, as it makes its way to implementation. And yet, you know, when, so I think simultaneously uh, applauding the amazing work that has been done by many of the people in this room and elsewhere to find justice for workers uh, by working around, you know, inadequate laws and um, failure of the, the ability. So what's the pathway? What comes next? Can we build this into something? Because it seems to me we shouldn't have to do this one state at a time, one sector at a time. 
it's great that we're doing it, and I think it raises, it, it's may, hopefully maybe changing businesses' uh, views of the, the value of this and their like knee-jerk reaction, like we don't want any more regulation, we just want to be able to take care of this on ourselves. And I think, Anna, you did a great job discussing how pathetic that is. Sure. Uh, oh, we're adding more. Oh. That wasn't big enough. We're going to add more. <laughs> I have a question for Kate. And um, I know you're relatively new, but um, if you have any insight into the early days of the Standards Council, uh, when you talk about having fewer workers in the work site and or working side by side with owners, um, strategies for uh, ensuring confidentiality and you know being anonymous or whatever you need to do. Um, you know, to protect from retaliation. I know there are binding requirements against retaliation, but in the very early days when perhaps farm owners uh, weren't as aware, or maybe they were always felt like those would be harsh consequences. Um, I guess, how do you keep them safe during an investigation when you have such a, a small number of people on a work site and it's probably pretty easy to determine who made the complaint? Okay. Panelists. All right. Um, so I think this is such an interesting question to try to answer and such an interesting question to try to answer within this space. Uh, you know, can this model lead to union organizing is, I think, a great question. And I think there's also, you know, we are coming out of a period where just a couple years ago, there was a large crackdown on worker centers who came too close to being unions. And that's a very risky line to try to put people in. Um, so I think, right, like I, I'm just being aware of the risks that exist for some of our members when I start to say, um, say things about union organizing and that it differs for folks in different sectors that there are members who are within the legal constraints of um, the laws around unions domestically, and then folks who are not. Um, and that changes the way that they talk about their work a lot, that that is very different in farm worker sectors than for construction. Um, but can it lead to union organizing? Uh, you know, I think that that is a worker-driven question. Um, and I think there was some talk in panels yesterday about you know, how the protections that exist legally then get incorporated into uh, the enforcement of WSR programs. So does that create more space for workers to organize? Definitely. If that is the direction that they are going, then it definitely does. Um, can it lead to legislation? Well, I think on that topic, just one more thing. You know, I've talked about the work of Satul in Minneapolis. They were at one point organizing with some workers at uh, who were doing janitorial work for Target, and you know, they went through this whole campaign. They were thinking about is WSR an option. They decided that they were going to form a union, and that is the direction that those workers chose to go. Um, and so I think that it's really. It, it, that to me feels like a worker driven question. I can see Judge Laura being ready to weigh in. Do you want to? I feel like all your, all your, um, oh, sorry, all your, your uh, questions. I feel like I'm footnoting your, because we deal with these, no, we deal with these actual, uh, you know, with these issues now and more and more as the program grows. So, you know, just two things for the history uh, buffs, you know, the, Bangladesh, the signatories to the Bangladesh Accords are unions, okay? And the, I mean, not only unions, human rights groups, and gender justice in Lesotho. Who came to Immokalee to learn about worker-driven social responsibility uh, with Solidarity Center and others from WRC? It was unions and human rights organizations, again, uh, we're now, as I said yesterday, in Colorado and California, where the right to unionize does exist and will be moving into countries. Thanks to iLab's support, we're in countries now where there is uh, freedom of association and collective bargaining rights uh, to greater and lesser degrees protected. So, 
it's a multi-pronged answer where unions already exist, but like as in Bangladesh and Pakistan, they hadn't solved the, the issue of factory safety and against fires and building collapse. And in, and in Lesotho, the, the unions were there, they were active, but they hadn't solved the problem of uh, gender-based violence in the workplace. And so they saw this as an additional arm. So it's not like, thank goodness, it's, it's not column A or column B. It's, you can have the whole smorgasbord as last night's dinner really reminded us. Um, <laughs> you know, you can, these are different means to an end, but they're also, I don't, I don't, I always find myself using the weapon uh, word, but you know, they're different tools to, to get uh, ends, and then when the right to unionize exists, again, you protect workers from retaliation for exercising those rights. But it's not an either or path, and you can, as Anna just said, create more space for those rights to be uh, exercised and enforced. Why don't I give um, the rest of the panelists a chance to respond? Yeah, I won't, I won't, I don't think there's anything to add about the question of legislation and unionization. Um, in terms of confidentiality for workers in the early years of this program, and as you're right, I've only been on the job since the summer, um, but we are in a period of expansion and we are adding new farms, and so I am tasked with onboarding them, and so I think I'm seeing history repeat a little bit in that regard. Um, Part of the way that workers are, are protected, I would say, is that the, the process is very one-on-one -on -one with the farmer. So I go out and sit down with a representative of the corporate buyer and first have a, one, maybe several conversations with farmers about their concerns, their questions about the program, what's expected of them. Then once they decide to sign on, we have an orientation that's equally detailed. Um, so by the time by the time workers are in, workers are like, taking advantage of the support line, for example, which is where they might run into retaliation, the farmers have been fairly well educated um, and have had a chance to raise concerns and get their questions answered. Um, so I think that probably reduces the likelihood of retaliation. I mean, certainly, you know, still, particularly because these are small family farms, farmers, I find, you know, they, they want workers to come to them when something is wrong. And so when workers go to us first, it's insulting, you know, which I can understand. Um, so we just, you know, it, we're a small program right now, so we talk about it a lot, um, and that, that seems to help quite a bit, but and also a constant reminder of workers' rights under the program and farmers' responsibilities under the program being, you actually are not allowed to retaliate or do anything that could be construed as retaliatory. That seems to help. Claudia, do you want to respond? Do you? Bueno, yo conforme a lo que hablaron de los sindicatos, para mí esa es una parte muy importante en, en lo que nosotros hacemos de organizar. En la campaña de los baños, primeramente, tenemos que organizar a los trabajadores, pero como yo dije, en un futuro para mí, para ver el cambio realmente, sería ser un sindicato independiente donde los trabajadores pelean directamente por sus derechos. Así que eso lo veo como algo en el futuro. I agree with what's been said about unions um, already. And for me, as we're starting with the worker organizing related to the restroom issue, you know, we're just starting with speaking to workers. We're not yet talking about unionizing, but that's really where we want this to lead. We would like this to lead to unionization, where the unionization, unions would be helping workers protect their own rights. Great. Uh, any more questions from the audience? Here, any, anything online? Oh, sorry. Hi, Maggie Gray at Delphi University. Um, so it, it's related to something that just was just brought up. So I have a question for um, Milk with Dignity and in the and Anna, what you're seeing in the programs, and maybe other folks from the FFP. And that is a question of: Are workers going directly to their employers? Right again, um, if they're calling the hotline, are they trying their employers first, and it's not? coming, or are they largely relying on the hotlines? And I guess I'm just asking, because I know a lot of the work is about empowerment and 
yet I also know how much fear there is, even with so many trainings. But this is one of the questions, and I'm also wondering if it's one of the goals of the program um, to try to eliminate, not eliminate, but to have the hotline be um, a last resort when you can't negotiate directly. Yeah, 100%. And I, I think um, all the options you talked about in terms of our workers calling the hotline first or they calling after talking to the boss hasn't worked, all of those things are happening. Um, you know, if it's a, a, a new worker, a young worker, they might call the hotline first. And often what our staff does is say to the worker, let me help you draft a text message in English that you can send to the farmer. Um, and most of the time, the worker will say, yes, let's do that. And then, you know, sometimes they'll add us in the thread to the text and, you know, um, if the worker says, I'm really uncomfortable with that, I'd rather you just talk to them, we honor that. But yes, absolutely over time. And you see workers who have been in the program for longer being much more willing to go straight to the employer. And then if that doesn't work, they might call us. Yeah, so absolutely. I think that's a really good North Star for the program. I mean, I can't speak to the individual responses. I think what I would say is, you know, looking overall at, it's really interesting to look at the trend lines of complaints that come in across the programs and how often they start low and then they go up, which doesn't sound good, right? Like complaints went up, but that means people are actually trusting that it, using it more. And this is happening domestically and you see it also in the international programs. Um, I think the international programs function differently because you are talking about building safety, right? So a worker isn't going to be able to address that directly with their boss. You know, that's really above like everybody in that building's pay grade probably. Um, that would be the only thing I would add. Great. Any more questions, comments? I'm going to go with Janice. No, no, I don't oh, okay. <laughs> uh, just to build off what Judge Laura was saying, um, I said it briefly, but I think it's at the end. So our WSR pilot in UK Fishing, we're also partnering with a union. They are a workers organization. And, you know, there is some um, difference in attitude about it within the organization, but a majority of them support it because they believe it will directly lead to increased unionization. And that's the, the reason why they're participating in it. Thought I saw another hand. Yep. Okay, well we have a little bit of extra time in the session which I think I'm gonna take advantage in the lead of Lenora from yesterday to give the panelists a chance to say any final words, any final takeaways that they would wanna share and then we can close out the session that way. And Anna, I'll put you on the spot and make you go first. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate the great conversation. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I talked within the course of my presentation a lot about false solutions that we face in campaigns versus um, how we see the model moving forward. And I think that continues to be my North Star in evaluating what makes sense is, does it change who has money and power in supply chains? And that that's really the question at the heart of what we're talking about here. Yeah, I would echo that and say that's a lot of what I, I think about it as well, that um, the role of, of some of the reforms or certification programs that are not WSR um, in being quick to, you know, I mean, across the market, right, to whitewash or greenwash or pinkwash or labor wash is because their profit margin is still the central axis of our governance, <laughs> right? So if it smooths, if a program smooths the fr friction with the values market, then it's fine. Um, and what WSR does is simultaneously build worker power and locate the power among workers um, to you know, regulate their own, their own work environment. And anybody who has ever studied standpoint theory knows that that's gonna be more effective. 
right? So um, I, yeah, really appreciate Perry for putting this together, and it's been really nice to hear from all these people doing this work. Yo realmente aprecio su atención para habernos escuchado de las campañas que tenemos, que queremos lograr. Eh, siempre hay desafíos, eh, por ejemplo, de los trabajadores que organizamos. Algunos tienen miedo a ser despedido, otros tienen miedo porque no saben sus derechos, otros realmente, no, eh, como dicen, tienen necesidad y no quieren perder el trabajo. Pero realmente nosotros como organizadores, eh, nuestra labor es convencerlos que necesitan ganar más y necesitan menos trabajo, porque realmente… Eh, sus beneficios, ellos no tienen beneficios como comunidad inmigrante, muchas veces no tenemos los mismos beneficios que a veces tienen las personas que tienen documentos, pero sí creemos que merecen un futuro mejor, ellos y su familia, todos completamente, y creo que eh, todos unidos podemos colaborar para que estas personas puedan tener mejoras laborales o más protecciones en los lugares de trabajo. Así que estoy realmente contenta de haber podido estar aquí y que toda la audiencia lo esté escuchando porque un día vamos a dar públicamente el informe de los trabajadores del campo, de los logros y de los, de los abusos que ellos viven en sus lugares de trabajo. Gracias. I don't think I'll get that perfectly. <laughs> that, was, that was really beautiful. Um, I appreciate all of your attention, this opportunity to share with you and learn from you. And just speaking of challenges, you know, we do constantly hear from workers of their fear of losing their jobs, their fear of being fired, and also many of their fears are based in not knowing that what their rights are. And so that's where we start as an organization, is talking to workers about their rights and then sharing with them about opportunities that we can um, achieve and what we can change through organizing. And we, um, you know, also so recognize these are immigrant farm workers that don't have the, oftentimes the same um, um the same conditions on the job, and maybe if they have the same rights, but they certainly don't have the same treatment as people who are documented. So these workers do deserve better. They deserve better for themselves. They deserve better for their families. And um, yeah, very happy to be here with you. And some other beautiful words that I did not <laughs> capture. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for your fantastic presentations. And that wraps up our sixth session. Thank you.